now there will be a record of this. So, Kaylin, what you asked um, was um, it says you can go over main function again related to the project. The instruction said to create one and place the dictionary inside of it, but I wasn't quite sure exactly how to do that. So if the function contains only print statement, is there a way to call the function so that it doesn't always return none at the end of the code block? So those are two different things. And um, we'll look at the first one, the, the main function. And then we'll take a look and, and see what kind of print statements you're talking about. So let's start off with main. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the search feature because I want you guys when you're doing this, when you're actively into this and continuing to work on it, I want you guys to, to be able to use this as a resource. And obviously I don't have, um, okay. Let's see. Let's see where main is. Because main is a function, but it is provided by Python. So it's not giving me a good. OK. Um, da 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 da. OK. Let's try this. If it does a complete character search, then we'll be fine. Here we go. No, that's not it. <coughs> my, my apologies. I am going to have a lot of tracking tonight. So So, and I'm doing this on purpose. I want you guys to see the process of solving the issues associated with, um, with working on this project. So I can go out online and I can say, what does it mean to define a main function? So this is what it means to define a main function right here. All the rest of the stuff, you can forget it. That's how to define a main function. So, um, whoops, come on, file new. Python file, um, sorry, I don't have a great imagination for names now. So we're going to call the main function. And the main function is the first thing that will always be called in a program. So let's just run this real quick. See if it can make a liar out of me. My cloud drive. I think that's in here. Stuff. Here we go. Okay. So let's run stuff and see what happens. So stuff didn't do it. I thought it did. Sorry. COVID has messed with my brain. So here's what we're going to do. This is how you define a main function right here. And what will happen is um, Python will go down and it will try and run this first if there are not other things happening. So you want to define the dictionary in main. So you're going to have your rooms dictionary. And that rooms dictionary is going to contain as the key the room. And then as the values, it's going to be another dictionary. And it's going to be a direction and then another room. And then a direction.
and then another room. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me again. Sorry about all the coughing. And then I'm going to have another line. Whoops, comma. And that other line is going to be the next room. So I'm going to have room two. And I'm going to have another dictionary. And I'm going to have uh, south. It's going to take me back to room one. Oops. And then I'm just making this really simple. So I'm going to have room three. And then I'm going to have um, north and room one. So here's a dictionary that is defined inside my main function. And the, the question really is, how do I get this to other stuff? And what they're trying to tell you to do here is to define everything in functions. So I would have another function that I could call main, and I would call it, and I would say def main, whoops, writing in Java. Do that quite often. And main would have my while loop. Um, I think that's the right way to spell it. Okay, so that's my sentinel value. And I'm going to say while, while test not equal sentinel. Oh, my bad. Sentinel equal go file dot equal q. Then I can do something. So what am I going to do? The first thing I'm going to do is check the validity. I'm going to ask for user input. Okay. And then I'm going to do something with that user input. So what I want to do is I want to check. So I've asked for the validity. I'm not going to write all of the code. So I'm asking for user input. And then after I get the user input, I'm just going to say and don't emulate this because it's not complete. Okay. So I now I'm asking the direction and I have to check the validity of the direction and what happens if I give it the direction. So here I'm just going to say check validity check and I'll let you guys do that. And then I want to say where do I go from here? So I want to move rooms because that's what I've done in the past. So um, actually, no, ignore what I'm saying. I want to do it this way. OK, so here's the main function. I'm going to have move. rooms here, and then I'm going to have def instructions. Um, so again, don't completely emulate mine. This is just giving you kind of a general direction and hints. So move rooms, I'm going to have to move from the current room to the next room. 
So how do I do that? What data do I need to do that? Well, I need a current room because I just said I needed a current room. And I need a direction because that's what I use here is the current room and the direction. And I'll probably have to pass in rooms as well because I'm in a function and since this is a function, it's in the local scope of the function. So here I'm going to pass in current rooms, direction, and the whole rooms dictionary. <coughs> and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, rooms of current room of direction. And I'm going, that's going to be my new room. New room. And then I'm going to return. And here I'm going to say current room equals move room. Current room, and I'm going to get an error here. Sure, and rooms. Okay, actually, we'll make this direction. So now I have to actually have a place to start. And I haven't given it a place to start. Right now I'm in my living room. The program doesn't know that. doesn't know whether I'm starting in room one, room two, or room three. So here I'm going to say current room is room one. So this is kind of how you do it, okay? You define a sentinel value. You have your, if my sentinel's not equal Q, because if it's equal Q, I'm going to break. Um, and in fact, um, I'll do that up here. It's better to do it here. So if my direction is true, I stop. I just stop the whole loop. If not, I move between rooms. So let's run this really quick and see what happens. Okay, see if I am completely nuts because I kind of feel that way tonight. So I'm going to debug it because I love the debugger. I'm in rooms. I don't have any errors. I'm defining rooms. There. Oh, it's a little too big. Okay. So I've defined rooms. My current room is room one. My sentinel value is go. While sentinel is not Q, so it's not. So I'm going to ask for direction. I know all my directions, so I'm going to put north. The direction is not Q. So I'm going to call move rooms. I'm going to call it with the current room of room one, the direction of north, and the rooms. So I'm going to step in and let's see what happens. Let's see if I go current room of direction is the new room. Let's see if I've messed something up. So my new room is room two. And all I did was follow the dictionary. I started with my current room. I gave it a direction. And the answer to that direction is the next room. And then I return it, and my current room now becomes room two. So if I then step over, because I haven't, didn't hit Q, what's my direction? Well, I'm going to go south this time. My direction isn't Q. I'm now going to go into my rooms again. Okay? So my current room is now room two, because I'd already moved rooms. The direction is south, and I've passed back in the rooms dictionary. So new room is the current room, which is room two, the direction, which is south, and that gives me room one. So I'm back at room one. And my current room is now room one. So that is the basic control structure of your program. Does that help a little bit, Kaylin? 
Okay. Um, what's the next question? Sorry. Anita, everything is important. It's okay. Um, but I'm trying to find a way to have it that if the user inputs Q for quit, it will always perform either quitting the game. Is there a way to do that without continually repeating? No, there isn't. Okay. Um, well, I'm sorry. There is a way to structure it to do that. So when it hits Q, I could do this. I could also not do that, but I would have to make sure that everything, here, here's the problem with not doing the if statement. I am, um, actually, I'm going to make this direction, and we're not going to worry about Sentinel. Sorry, I just changed it on you. Here's the problem with just relying on the top of the loop to, to do it. I have to decide what's going to happen here. So I have to do some form of an if statement. So I either have to do if direction, did I, I didn't type that right, is equal to Q break. That's one way to break because I don't want to do this if somebody said Q. If I did this and somebody put in Q, I'm going to blow up because there's no Q in this dictionary, and you're just going to get an exception. If I don't do that, then I have to do something like <coughs> Excuse me. Well, let, let me make this a little easier for myself. I'm going to say um, Direction and directions, and then put everything under that. Those are the only two ways to do it. Because if you want to rely on going back to the top of the loop, and there's a potential that your user input could not be correct, you either have to break if you want it to stop, continue if you want it to go to the top of the loop which is still an if statement, or you have to put all of the remainder of your code inside of another if. So you still have to do a branch there. Don't know what branch you prefer, but you still have to branch. Does that make some sense? Okay. And as far as your none, Kaylin, um, I'm just going to need, you're just going to need to send me your code so I can get a better idea of what you're talking about. And I'm glad that helped. So if everybody's okay, I'm probably going to speed talk my way through most of modules, the, the lecture for module seven. All of this stuff will be up on the, on the YouTube page, but also there are previous, um, there are previous Module 7 lectures that don't have me um, with being a little bit muddled from COVID. So um, let's go through that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go kind of quickly. I probably won't do much of um, the actual going through the Python projects tonight because I just don't think that I will have the voice. And then um, if you guys have questions, you can ask them. And always, if you're in my class, contact me, and um, I'll help you get moving. So let's go to the lecture. OK. So, well, that's week eight. I don't want week eight. I want week seven. That's better. So, we're talking about files and data storage. Because that's what, <coughs> excuse me, files are about. They're about storing data on the hard drive. Everything we've done till now has been executed in the memory of the system, which means it's transient. It will go away. 
if I shut my computer off right now and I have I have any of the Python programs that we have run previously with all any user data that I've put in, if I like accidentally shut my computer off right now, all that stuff would be gone because it's not sitting on the hard drive of the computer. So we have to now start working with files. And we can think of files as everything's a file. This PowerPoint, or sorry, this um, presentation is a file. PyCharm is a file. So we have some new functions that we're going to be using, um, and we can get rid of break and continue. My apologies. So let's just look at those three top lines. Open, close, and read. Those are the three things you need in, those are the three basic things you need in the world of file processing. Okay, let's do that again. Hold on. Okie dokie. I found the def if you don't, don't with return with value you will. Ah, thank you Anita very much for looking into that. And where am I? Uh, extra seven. Okay. So here are the new things that we need to know about function. We're really not going to have any new keywords, but we're relying on built-in functions that Python gives us. Open, close, and read. Open is how you get at the file. It doesn't actually give you the data in it, but it points to it. Close is removing that pointer to the file. And read is getting you the contents of a file. Now, there are bunches of ways to read files. You will find that there are all kinds. These are the three basics. These are the three basics that you will have to understand tonight, and then there's a couple extra. Okay, what is a file? Everything is a file. PyCharm, Py, Python interpreter, PyCharm, PY files, Microsoft, the operating system on my computer is a series of files. Those files happen to be executable and they run the operating system. But they're all files. Everything on most computers relies on storing files to disk. So what can I do with a file? Well, my second favorite topic in programming is CRUD. We've been through this a lot. You can create it, you can read it, you can update it, and you can delete it. Those are the four things you can do with a file. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, so a little bit about files and operating systems. Every operating system handles files differently. Every single one of them. Microsoft handles it different than Linux. Linux and Mac are relatively close, but they're not completely close. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, so how do we make it so that I can write one Python program that can run on Windows, Linux, or Mac? Well, the great thing is that Python neutralizes all of this stuff with operating systems. And we will get into that more a little bit later. But it's called write once, run many. So I can use Python functionality so that if I run it on a Windows or Linux or Mac, it's all going to work the same. So what is a file? Well, a file is two things. Files is a series of properties as well as the data that is inside the file. So we think of a file, but, you know, we think of a file as maybe having text in it. But that file also has properties, and the properties are name, size, and where it lives on disk. That's called metadata, and it's contained in the file object. This is our first real explicit foray into objects in Python. And next week, we're going to talk all about classes and objects. So I have a thing called a file, OK? My file has properties and contents. So the, the properties of my file are the name, and the name of my file is my first file. The property, it's 28 bytes. It's under Homel Shannon. And then, separate from that, it has contents. 
and the content says this is a file with two lines. Okay, so why did I just go all that about properties? Well, because the first thing you have to do with a file is open it. Open it does not equal reading. Open it means that you have asked your operating system to give you a file descriptor. And that file descriptor gives you permission to go and do something to that file. It gives you the ability to read the file, to write the file, to delete the file. But you need, or they call it here a file descriptor. Um, you need that file descriptor because that's the only way you're going to get into the file. So the first thing you have to do is get the descriptor, and then you can get at the data in the file. So that's what open does. And my variable on the left-hand side of this statement is not the contents of the file. It is a way to get to the contents of the file. So it's a descriptor. You can think of it as a pointer or an arrow. Open is the name of the function. Open takes a couple of different arguments. Open just tells Python to get the descriptor. Open needs a file name, and it should be fully qualified. Right now, we don't have to worry about that. I didn't want to type the extra letters. Fully qualified means that you give it the full path on the system. And then we have a mode. There are four modes, but you can combine them. Read only, write only, append, and binary. So you can have a read-write file, you can have a read-write-append file, you can have an append only, you don't want them to be able to remove the contents of the file. There's all kinds of ways you can combine those modes. But those are the basics of the open statement and that's what you need. And you need to tell it the mode because your operating system needs to know what you're planning on doing with the file. And then you have to close. I will be talking about this as much as I can tonight while my voice lasts. <coughs> Close releases the file descriptor back to the operating system. Why is that important? It's important because there are only so many file descriptors that you get in an operating system. They just are. It's a really big number. But if you are writing a very large program that is file system intensive, you have to know how to manage those file descriptors. And the only way to manage them is to close and return the file descriptor. Um, so, quick rule. If a file already exists in a location, Python will open it. If it does not exist in the location, it, Python will create it when using the W or R mode. And then you're going to see this other rule down here. It's probably going to drive you nuts. Opening a file uses system resources. System resources are finite. Remember to close the file. Always remember to close the file. OK, so I know how to get at the file. But how do I get at the contents of the file? Well, I get at the contents of the file by reading the file. So I've opened it, and now I'm reading it. And reading just has read. and what read does is it goes and gets all of the contents from the file, and it uses the file descriptor to do that. So you will see here that my file equal open. So then I use that my file file descriptor, and I use that to read the file. So I can't go directly to the file. I have to use that file descriptor. And that's one of the ways that Python is separating us from the operating system. And what happens when I read the file? Well, I get the contents of the file, which to Python look like this. To my human eye, there would be um, a carriage return, but that slash n in the middle is actually um, what Python sees. So remember to close your file. OK. So that just read all the contents what we just did. And that's fine if you have two lines in a file. If you have a lot of lines in the file, or you're trying to put some kind of structure to the file, or somebody has put some structure to the file, then you're going to want to be able to read the file differently. So here, I have my same first file, 
exact same thing, but now I'm using a function called read lines. And what this does is instead of taking everything and making it a string, what it does is it takes everything and at every new line it creates an entry in a list. So that's what I would have for my list from my file. Where did my little graphic go? It went to the end. Okay. So this is a text file with two lines. Because I'm using read lines, different than the last slide, the last slide was read, this is read lines, I get a list. And that can be very handy when you're processing stuff. So here's the other issue. If you have a really, really big file, you're probably not going to want to read everything all at once. Maybe you want to read things line by line in a loop because you're going to stop after you hit a certain number or a certain condition. So. I'm back to my file open. Now I have something different. I have a four line in my file. Now we have used four previously in, uh, sorry, four and in previously for lists. And we're going to use it now for the same thing. Because when we do a four line in my file or in the file descriptor, what Python is going to do is it's going to give us a line back. And a line is defined as having a carriage return at the end. So every time somebody has written out a line and file and hit the enter key, that's going to be another line that comes in from this particular for loop. So I'm going to have print line, and I'm going to print this is a text file. And then it's going to go back up to the top of the loop. It's going to get the second line, and it's going to print, this is a text file. Now, these are very simple examples, but they represent how you have to file, do file handling. File handling is very important. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, and remember to close a file. So... Closing a file. It returns the file descriptor to the system. Um, sorry. <coughs> I have to grab something to drink really quick. I'll keep trying to talk. Because um, there are only so many around, you have to manage it. If you're a programmer, there are things you have to manage, and file descriptors is one of them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. All right. Close does something else. It writes any changes you've made to the file to disk. So what in the world am I talking about? Didn't that happen when I wrote to the file? Well, no. File says, sorry, close says, if there's anything that hasn't been written to this file, write it now. So if you, if you um, use a file, and don't close it, <coughs> there may never be any, you may never actually make a change to the file on disk. Because a lot of times, Python processes things in RAM, and then it will write it when it feels like it. <coughs> so writing a file. I have something called my empty file.txt, and I'm using the write mode to open it, which tells Python I'm going to write to the file. Well, there's this little thing in between called a buffer. So, and this is where that close comes in, because the buffer is actually a place in RAM. It's not on disk. And it's going to hold your data there until Python's ready to write it or until you tell it to write it. So I'm going to use the write function. It's a very easy function. It's just going to keep writing and lines to the file. I'm going to write the second line to the file. When I close, that's when those two lines will get written to disk. So close is very important for that reason. Um, one thing to note, if you open a file with write-only permissions and not read-write, you will erase any existing data in the file.
So what if I'm processing a lot of data? What do I do? What if I'm going to have a big file? Well, there's other ways to manage that buffer. Once you open a file, and this is just a for loop. All, the only thing I'm doing here is just this is a way to create a big file. And I'm going to write big file 100 times to my buffer. But let's say um, every 10th time I want to flush the buffer, buffer and write it to um, the file. So I'm going to say myfile.flush. Flush says, hey, Python, clear the buffer and write everything to the file so I don't miss anything, you know, so something doesn't happen. If my program crashes, at least those 10 files are in the, are actually written to disk. And you still have to close it after the loop exits because no matter what, how many times you flush, you have to still return the file descriptor. If you're dealing with large data sets, always remember to flush. I know these are very trivial examples, but when you start to get out there and you're writing programs that deal with large files, if you're not dealing with like a, a database already that will do the flushing for you, you're going to have to remember how to manage that. So managing a file with the word with. So with is in fact a new keyword. I didn't put it on my slide. Um, that's made for managing files, and it automatically does the close for you. So the syntax is, you use the word with, and then you have your open, as you would normally have an open. It's the same function. And then you have the keyword as, and then you give it the file object, the file descriptor. So anything I do associated with the file inside the loop is going to be done on that descriptor. So I want to read a line. So I'm going to read the first line. And I'm going to print the first line. And then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. And I'm going to read the second line. And then I'm going to print file closed automatically after exiting with. So I don't have to do the close if I am in a loop that began with the word with. Now, with only, only works on files. You can't do this in, with lists or anything like else. It's specifically there for files. And it's with and as. Those are the two keywords. With is a loop. It processes the file until it reaches the end. And when it reaches the end, and you exit out of the loop, it closes it for you. So working with the operating system, I mentioned this before, but all operating systems deal with files differently. That was one of the, when I first started programming, you know, a million years ago, we didn't have this. Um, and, and languages like C and C++, you also don't have this currently. So you have to be operating, speci operating system specific when dealing with files. Well, that can be, not fun because you've got different flashes and you know Windows starts at C colon and Linux starts at home or root or slash or so Python neutralizes these differences and it makes it easier so there's a whole bunch of Python modules associated with handling files and these are just a couple <coughs> sorry Python modules <coughs> Python modules are files, and they just contain a lot of functions. And they're predefined functions. Um, a lot of them come from python.org. Some of them don't. Um, but there are all kinds of GitHub projects out there and companies that write stuff just for Python and will sell it to you. So um, if you're dealing with the operating system in Python, there is a module called OS for operating system. The OS module you may, is, is the thing that will neutralize that nasty path separator between Win Windows and Linux. OS makes it manageable. I use OS all the time. Okay, 
Import is a special keyword. It tells Python that it's going to open and it's going to open another Python file that's external to this one, and it's going to bring all of this stuff into memory so you can use it. And you didn't have to write it. All you had to do was use the import statement. After the word, the keyword import, you are going to use the the characters OS, and that's the module name in this case. So let's say I have a Windows machine and I have a Linux machine, and uh, under home L Shannon module six lecture dot key, I want to be able to get the right file path no matter whether I'm on Windows or on Linux. So on Windows and Linux, because I'm using the OS module, that's what it's going to give me. And on Windows, it's going to give me the correct slashes. So it's easier to structure your data if you're using the OS module, and it also makes using OS manageable. I have had to write different versions of C and C++ for different operating systems. And then, of course, having to recompile them for the different operating systems can be a little less than fun. Okay, so a lot of files aren't human readable. Most files aren't human readable. If you attempted to open a Microsoft Office document in a text editor, you will see that it is not readable. It's binary data. It's encoded data. Um, and the majority of files are stored like that. Now, there are complex algorithms associated with how they make these binary, and especially with imaging. But pretty much everything we use, almost the stuff we use. So how does Python do binary? Well, Python has a special nomenclature. If you see a variable, and on the right-hand side is the letter B, not in quotes, and then some things in quotes, that's an indication that Py you want Python to treat whatever comes after it as binary. So B is special. Um, and if I print my bytes and I type my bytes, sorry, um, if I print it or if I type it, it will tell me that it is binary. And um, comma-separated value files. Why, why do you need to know about comma-separated value files? Because there are the way spreadsheets are organized, but mostly because you're required to do this for Lab 7.8. And I know that the labs are like mini projects. So um, I know there's a lot going on this week. So I have, there's a file out there called comma delimited.py, which might be helpful. And what all comma delimited does is it breaks up your file by commas. And we know how to do, and when it does that, it is going to create a matrix. So what do I have to do? Well, first I have to import my CSV module, because that's what Python gives me to say, okay, Everything in here, you know, I, now, sorry, COVID break. Let me move back. The CSV module allows you to handle comma-separated value files. That's its reason for being. And it gives you a lot of tools to do that. But you have to do a couple things first. The first thing you have to do is import it. So Python has access to all that code. Then for something like this, we're going to need a place to put the information. And it's going to be a list. Okay, comma separated value files are lists. And they're all often multi-dimensional lists. And then I've got my with open. So I'm going to open my words.csv file as words. And then I'm going to say content equals csv.reader words delimiter comma. So content is just a variable. Could have been Fred. But I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side, csv is the name of the module. Reader is the function. And what the reader does is it takes my pre-existing, sorry, it takes 
words and um, applies the delimiter comma. So it takes my file descriptor and it says, hey, my delimiter is a comma. So that's how I'm going to be separating things. Could have been a space, could have been a pipe, could have been the letter Q. Doesn't matter. It's just the delimiter. So now I have a comma separated value. And when you think comma separated value, you want to think multi-dimensional lists. So in case there are multiple lines in the file, you're going to say for row and content, then for counter in range length of row. This is kind of standard. And I'm going to say if row counter is not in word list, make sure the word is not already in the list, then I'm going to append it. This might seem similar to something you have to do this week. And then when I'm done, I'm going to print the word list. So, <coughs> excuse me, the new parts are with open as words and then the CSV reader because that's what's getting all of the information in this words.csv file and making it what it has to be. So if there is a new line, you're going to have any new line, you're going to have a multidimensional list. Okay, so list to a dictionary. You're going to need this for 7.9. Okay, so there's something called dict.txt, and it contains key value pairs, and uh, the keys are stored on different lines than the values. So what I get is I get this contents, and it has name, Lisa, answer 42. Amount is 3.14. Well, how do we make that a key value pair? So first of all, I create an empty dictionary, and then I go through the contents. And, and by this way, this isn't necessarily file-based. This is just showing you how to do it. So in this case, I'm definitely using a counter because I'm going to skip things. And what I want to basically do is the, the 0 and 1 position are going to be a key value pair. The two and three position are going to keep, be a key value pair. And the four and five position are going to be a key value pair. So that's what that if statement is. And then if it's not already in the, dic the dictionary, I'm going to um, put it in the dictionary. And then I'm going to print it out beautifully and format it when I'm all done. So... Um, for this example, I'm using a list. I'm not opening a file, but you're going to have to open a file. Okay. So, 7.8, this is just the pseudocode. It shows you how to do the CSV file, and it's very similar to what we did previously, and there are a bunch of little hints. This is a much longer one. This is like a, a mini project, and that's one of the reasons I've specifically make sure I do this pseudocode in detail because this is writing a second project while you're writing your project. So you're going to have a couple of files. Um, you're going to have to create an empty dictionary, an empty list, and another empty list. And then basically what you're doing is um, from the first item in the list, you're going to have to make these into a dictionary. So you're going to have to add all this stuff with key value pairs into the dictionary. And then, um, and this is very similar to, you know, taking 0 and 1 and making them the key value pair, and then 2 and 3 and making them a key value pair. And then you got to sort it. Now, um, you want to use the sorted lists, okay? So you've got, um, so look at the sorted function. Don't try and write a sort yourself. I mean, unless you really want to. Use what Python gives you. And if you need to go out online and say, hey, how do I, what, how do I use sorted to sort a dictionary, go look it up. Um, so now we've got to change the, the dictionary back into a list. And then we've got to um, split it and sort it and write it to a file. We have to write to two separate files. 
So it seems like a lot of data churning, and it is. Um, but that's basically what you have to do. You're going to end up with two separate output files. Okay, you're going to have openkeys.txt, which is going to have the keys, and you're going to have output titles, which is going to have the titles. So that's a lot of stuff to do to get to this part, which is the new part. So refer back to this when you're doing 7.9. I know that was fast, and I kind of apologize. Does, oh, let's see. Does anybody have any questions? You can open up the mics if you've got a question. <coughs> going once, because my voice is going. Going twice. Okay. Everybody have a nice evening. I will put this up online tomorrow, and there's also other Module 7s that might have more detail because of my timing and my voice. Everybody have a good evening.